Daniel speak, talking to us about the church, series on the church. All oh, that's important. Before he comes, I'd like to ask all of you to stand. And with holy hands lifted up, Father, we come to you now in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God now. Father, hedge, build a hedge about this place. I never deem it a doubt, denial, Father, and dismay that we might receive your Word, receive it with power, Father, that it might go forth in a way uh, that someone might fall out with sin tonight and come to know you as Lord and Savior in their life. Be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Brother Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Lord. service this evening. Appreciate the good prayer uh, before we enter the pulpit. Uh, it's always uh, it's, it's a miracle of the Lord uh, for us to come in and hear His Word. Uh, when we pray in our Bible study, I pray that we're asking God to give us wisdom uh, when we study His Word uh, because He said He would. If we would just ask. Uh, he said He would. And so as we uh, study His Word from day to day, I pray that you're, you're doing just that uh, in the, to the Lord in prayer, asking Him for wisdom of Scripture. Uh, this evening, uh, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. If you're here uh, visiting with us or for the first time on Sunday evening, uh, we've, we've been in a series. This is week number 4. And we're talking about the importance or the priority of church according to Scripture. And then on Wednesday nights, Brother Lee Green has been doing a fantastic job of, uh, of uh, teaching about uh, church membership and, and what that really means and what that looks like uh, to be a healthy church member. And so if you've not attended that, uh, you don't have to be for all of them. You can, you can start now and uh, come and be with us on, on this Wednesday. Um, in week number one, we started with the prophecy pertaining to the establishment of the church. And so the point was, it wasn't something that just happened. The church didn't just happen. It was planned by God and orchestrated uh, from the beginning of time. And the church started in Jerusalem, and, and that's how the prophecy went. And so in Acts chapter 2, we see where 3,000 souls were added to the church. And uh, so that, that was week one. Week two, we covered several verses. And one of those that stood out to me was that Jesus gave his life for the church. Jesus gave his life for the church, and that was in uh, Ephesians 5.25. Uh, but we read from Ephesians 5.21-32, uh, powerful words that were describing the church as the body of Christ and how Christ gave himself uh, for the church so that he might cleanse the church and washing uh, by the water, by the word, he might present that church, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle. And so when we talk about the priority of church, what I want us to see is that God puts a priority in church. It is God who establishes that in His Word. Week 3, we considered Ephesians uh, 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 2 to 22, and how the principalities and powers in heavenly places uh, by the church or through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is known. And so we talked about the church as a mystery. Because the Word of God talks about the church as a mystery. And it, that mystery was revealed in New Testament. And, and it's not just revealed to uh, earthly beings, human creation of God, but it's heavenly hosts that observe the church. And it's through the church that the manifold, the many colors, the manifold wisdom of God is known. But the thought in week number three was what we wanted to do is we wanted to turn that corner for us to begin to consider the local church 
And we, we read several verses uh, that, that uh, talk about from Acts, Corinthians, uh, finally in Revelation, all talking about the local assembly, specific churches in Scripture. And I did that because, listen, it's easy for us to say, okay, uh, it's the invisible church. That's what God's talking about, the invisible church. And there's room for that in Scripture, and that, that certainly exists. But there is a local assembly church that God is interested in, and for us, as we begin this, uh, or continue this series, uh, specifically for us in a sunshine free Baptist church. The word church in the New Testament is translated as church from the Greek word ecclesia, which just means an assembly or a gathering of people. And so that's what the church literally is, ecclesia in the Greek, and it's just a gathering together of people. Did you hear uh, from Steve Berry this morning as he talked about uh, the churches in Florida, how they went from uh, 72, I believe it was, to 60 uh, in the time that he was there. And then there was another state, uh, I've got a guess at it, but I'm sure I'll get it wrong, but uh, another state where uh, a friend of his was at, and in his time in that state, the, the Free Will Baptist churches had went from like 200 to 100 and all taking place in the span of like 10 to 20 years. And so we see this uh, de decrease. And we've talked about statistics like from George Barna, where it says one out of five people uh, believe the involvement of the congregation is necessary for spiritual growth, and how one out of three evangelicals uh, believe that involvement in a congregation is necessary for spiritual growth. But I, I pray that through this so far, what we've concluded, According to God's Word, not, not Jody's ideas, not Jody's uh, you know, thoughts, but by God's Word, there is no plan B. There is no plan B. Amen. God's plan to carry out the Gospel in this world is through the church. We'll not think of a better way. We'll not think, we'll not be more inventive than God. It is going to be through the church. And so Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we're going to look at verses 11 through 16. And what we're going to begin to tackle, we won't tackle it all tonight, but what we'll begin to tackle then is what really is the church? Well, what is the church supposed to do? And what does that look like? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. And it gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Amen. Once again, I appreciate Brother Eddie Meredith's uh, prayer uh, before even entering the pulpit upon the message this evening. I want you to know this. We can't sit and worry we can't sit and worry if we're going to be one of those churches that just dies. <laughs> the life of the church is not ours to give. However, we do need to be vigilant. We need to be awake Amen. regarding the times in which we live. The question is, are we doing as a church what, should be, what we should be doing? Are we producing what we should be producing. What is our aim as a church? It's been said that if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. By the Scripture this evening, we see that leaders are placed 
in the local body. And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Can we conclude that uh, this is played out in the local church? Can we, can we conclude this evening and come in agreement together that when we're talking about He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, that these evangelists and pastors and teachers are all serving somewhere in the local body, that it's not just this invisible thing that's happening, but it actually pertains to the local church? Yes, God can set us in an invisible church. He can set us in a way that pleases Him in this invisible church that there is. But let me tell you, in the context in what we read in Ephesians chapter 4, it seems more applicable than it is pertaining to the local assembly of the church. And why did He do this? Why did He give some pastors, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists? Why did He set those people in the local church, in the assembly together? He set him there for the perfecting of the saints. Do you know what the word perfecting means? In the Greek, it means to complete furnish. To be completely furnished. That's what the word means. To be completely furnished or equipped. And so the, the, the role of the apostles, the, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers are to make sure that the saints are completely furnished with the knowledge that they need of, the, of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can do the work of the ministry of God. The gathering together of the local body should produce saints who are equipped or completely furnished to do the work of the ministry. And with that question, I'd like to pause and just ask ourselves, are we doing that? Are you being, do you feel as saints, do you feel like you're being furnished, completely furnished, equipped with what you need in order to carry out the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you don't, somewhere we're failing. If you do, if you're furnished, as Brother Eddie said uh, early on in, in the service, maybe God has equipped you, but you've not stepped out. I pray that you'll consider what it is that God would have you to do. Secondly, I want you to see that saints are equipped for the work of ministry. Saints are equipped for the work of ministry. Once you're equipped, once you're uh, completely furnished with those things that you need in order to carry out the work of the ministry, then the work has to start and you have to step out in faith. I want to I want to stop just for a second and say this. You know, when I preach this message, it, you know, it, it needs to fit where it needs to fit. And in other things, we just need to consider and make sure that in the in the future, as we look ahead, that we don't don't fall into certain ruts as other churches may have done. I want to stop and say this. I'm thankful for those who worked in VBS this past week. I'm thankful for that. Listen, uh, you know, as a pastor, there is no way that I could orchestrate a vacation Bible school and still do all the other things that I do. I just, I don't have enough time for that. But we had people who were willing to step up and say, I'll lead BBS, I'll help in BBS, I'll, I'll do these things, I'll make sure that stacks are taken care of, that teachers' positions are taken care of, that, you know, games and all those things. I'm thankful for our older youth. I don't know if you know this or not, but many of our teens helped out in Vacation Bible School this past week. They served in some capacity, whether it was a helper to a teacher or, or taking uh, uh, pictures or, or video and things, but they helped out and contributed in some way, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for those who are willing to open up their homes uh, to the college students that we heard this morning uh, uh, sing for us and share with us the gift that God has given to them. And so we had people open up their homes. And I'll even say this, not only did we have enough people to open up their homes so they had a place to stay, but we had people on the reserve that said, listen, if it falls through, my house is open and I'll do that. I'm thankful for those willing to take the lead in, on organizing uh, and uh, to make that stay for the college uh, group uh, special this week. They've been serving all summer, and for, for them to come here to our church and to experience what they experienced with dinner last night and then lunch after church uh, today, I, I believe was refreshing for them to kind of be on the receiving end. And so you exalted them higher than you did yourselves. 
And for that, I'm thankful to be part of such a church. I'm thankful for those who are willing to take on more responsibility in our church and lead our strategic groups as we uh, get more intentional as a church on the things that we're going to do and accomplish. You know, we said uh, this summer was going to be a time of tooling, a time of sowing. And uh, when we tool and we sow, uh, we don't always see uh, pr uh, uh, fruit produced immediately. Uh, it's all that labor that takes place and the fruit comes later. And, and that might be exactly what we experience this summer as we go through this series. But there's something unhealthy about churches today. There's something unhealthy about churches today. I'm thankful at this time to be your pastor and to be a bivocational pastor. It's, it's possible that we could fall into a rut like other churches of paying staff to do the work of the church. And I'm grateful for whatever the church is able to uh, give to us as a family, as a pastor family. God is making provisions for us. However, there's a warning for me as a pastor there's a warning for me to not be in this for the money. Amen. Blessing, Lord. Come on, brother. And now I think for the church, there's also a warning to not be satisfied with just paying someone to do the work of the ministry. Amen. In this season that we're in as a church right now, this seems appropriate for us to be in the position we're in. I see job announcements for pastors and I'm not looking at those because I'm looking to leave or take another church. I'm looking at those just kind of out of curiosity uh, to see what it is that people are looking for. And can I tell you, there's churches across this nation who are looking for pastors. They need pastors to step in and fill those positions. But as I look at the job descriptions, this is what concerns me. It sounds as if there's churches that are looking for a pastor to come in and do the whole thing. To preach the Gospel, to organize, to develop, to run, to uh, you know, advertise, to whatever it is that needs to be done in the church. They're looking for someone to come in and do all of those things. Now listen, that's not a complaint and say, okay, pastors can't do it all. What that is saying is there's an unhealthiness. If you've got one or two or three individuals trying to do it all and you're not invested in the work of the ministry, that is scary because if one or two or three people leave, what are you going to do as a church? Amen. And so it's important for us as a congregation to know this. And I pray that you feel this way. That there is, yes, there is a head of this church. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. There is a shepherd of this church. And God has appointed me in this season to be that shepherd. But as far as a body of Christ, we are all members, each one of us. There is none of us that is any more important than the other person. And if we will unify and bind ourselves together in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll do everything that God has gifted us to do in order to carry out the work of the ministry, I believe that God can bless our church. We can see people saved and we can see the church grow in strength and spiritually. Finally, I want us to look there is a result to the edifying of the body of Christ. There is uh, results to uh, the prophets and the evangelists being in place. And as they uh, do that in a healthy way, uh, the saints are being equipped and perfected for the work of the ministry. And as that is carried out, it says there's an edifying of the body of Christ. There's an edifying of the body of Christ. This aspect would be applicable to both the visible and the invisible church. And this word edifying means to build up. There's a building up. There's an edifying. There's an edification that takes place. There's an act of one who promotes another's growth in Christian wisdom and piety and happiness and holiness. And so as these things come together, as we do those things that God has called us to do as a church, the Bible says that the body of Christ, the church, is edified and it's lifted up. And that's exactly what we've been called to do. I want to share this with you before we begin to wind down. I know that's been a long week and a long weekend, and so we'll try to keep this short. Among evangelical churches, those under three years old will win 10 people to Christ per year.
for every 100 members. Those 3 to 15 year old uh, churches will win 5 people per year uh, for every 100 members. And age 15 uh, uh, years old of the church, the numbers drop to 3 per year. Now listen, statistics are statistics. You know, churches are churches. We're all individuals. But I do see this. I do see that as a church is, uh, is in place longer, there seems to be less and less produced as far as uh, conversions go. And I, I've, you know, I, I can't uh, tell you uh, specific uh, statistics, but I've heard pra pastors talk about that, how you have a church plant and there's excitement and there's growth. And, but then over time, you know, growth, 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 and then it plateaus. And then you don't see the growth anymore and there seems to be dwindling, dwindling, and they call it a, a life cycle of the church. But the bottom line, the younger the church, the more uh, fruit it seems to produce. But as a church uh, grows older in age, there seems to be a tendency to not, not be as fruitful. And here's the question, why? Why? And I'm not sure that we can answer that question today, but I, I know this. Does it have to be? Does it have to be that way? Isn't God the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? Isn't, uh, you know, it doesn't matter the longevity of our church whether we were just planted here a year ago or whether we've been in place a hundred years. Isn't God's sal uh, salvation and the sovereignty of God isn't the same as it was when we began? Sure it is. Sure it is. I want to caution us about, uh, you know, looking at maybe being complacent or being satisfied with where we're at or where God has brought us to. There's souls that still need to be saved. There's people that still need to be brought to maturity. We want to raise uh, our young people up in a way that they can serve and that the church will carry on for more and more generations. I told you I'll be short and I'll, I'll try to honor that. Uh, as we get ready to close, I want to say this just from a, a personal standpoint. My personal readings have been in the book of Jeremiah. And uh, what we read tonight is God said He put some apostles, some pastors and teachers, He put those in place and, and that, uh, you know, uh, equips the saints. The saints do the work. The church is edified. And so that's the purpose of the church. But in the book of Jeremiah, there was a time that uh, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, uh, there was other prophets that were there. And the prophets, all the other prophets were saying this. They were saying, peace. Peace, you know. Don't worry about things. Don't worry about things. God's going to take care of everything. Don't worry about anything. You know, just go about your way. And then it came time they were going to be exiled. And one of the uh, prophets specifically said, hey, don't worry about it. God's going to bring us back in two years. It's not going to matter. And he even said this. He said the enemy, uh, you know, Jeremiah had a yoke on himself. And, and uh, this other prophet come up and said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to break this yoke. And in two years, God's going to bring us back. And Jeremiah just walked away. Yeah. But then Jeremiah came back and he said, listen, yeah. that wooden yoke, God's changed it to a yoke of iron. You will not break it. Yeah. We're not coming back in two years. Listen, this is desperate, Jeremiah says. And he called for repentance. And nobody came. You know why? Because, listen, the people were receiving mixed signals. Some prophets were saying, don't worry about it. If Jeremiah was saying, listen, repent. It's not right. I don't want us to worry with a sinful worry about our church. But I do ask that we be so invested in our church that like Paul talks about the weight of the church, that we all feel a little bit of that weight, that we're all intentional about what we do, that we're submissive one to another, that we exalt one another in the unity of the, the, the body of Christ so that we might carry out God's instructions and that His church, His body, might be lifted up. Would you bow your heads with us, please?